thing, um, the, uh, those who, we have vacation Bible school coming up, coming up June the uh, 10th, excuse me, June the 17th, and uh, um, we need workers for that. So at the end of the service today, you will see Miss Carolyn, and she'll, uh, she'll tell you what all is needed to do for that. So there's already folks that's already signed up in various things, but we need you as well. So anyways, come see her about that. The, uh, this is kind of exciting for me, believe it or not. Um, the, uh, when it, a long time ago, whenever I first started preaching here, uh, lightning struck the transformer, and the, uh, it actually went out. And that's the reason why we have what we call Fireside Fellowship, because the, that Sunday, uh, I preached a sermon, and back in the day, I used to wear a tie and a jacket. And uh, uh, what you don't know is when preachers would dress up in tie and jackets and stuff, then you only iron the front part of your shirt because no one sees the back part. <laughs> so uh, that Sunday I came here, there was a lightning storm and hit the transformer, just like the transformer's out right now. And I took off my shirt and showed everybody my secret. Uh, anyway, roll out my sleeves. But the, the sermon that morning was uh, about the body of Christ coming together. And I had a charcoal briquette. And the whole sermon was having how one charcoal briquette would be on fire. But by itself, it can go out. But if you got that charcoal briquette next to briquette next to the other bunch of briquettes, then they all light one another on fire. And I liken that to uh, the scripture about how about how we need to come together and worship together corporately. About how it's important. If not, we burn out right. on ourselves. We burn out. But corporately <laughs> together, we're able to grow and grow in our flame and our passion for God. So anyway, so that was the sermon then. That's what started the Fireside Fellowship. There was only, Caroline, you were here then. There was only probably about 26 of us here uh, then. Now we got a little, about 100 more than that here today. So that's awesome. I'll, uh, I'll try not to get long-winded today. Uh, we're going to be in John the 6th chapter. Tell me that not to get long-winded is like telling, you know, the wind not to blow in March. But anyways, I will try my best. I hope that you guys like my invention over there with the old school uh, uh, air conditioner with uh, the ice in front of the fan. That's the best we can do this morning. Thank you for sticking around, though. I know it's hot in here, uh, but uh, uh, if, you, if you focus on the heat and nothing else, then you might as well leave right now, to be honest with you. We've got to focus on the Word of God. Because I can see you, the disciples, and all those that followed Christ back in the day, they were not in air-conditioned buildings. They were not walking around after Jesus going, man, it's hot in here. Uh, we need to whatever. You know, that wasn't the case. They were walking after Christ, literally walking with sandals, uh, sometimes eating food, sometimes not eating food. And so, and so for us today, we're actually sacrificing a, a bit, getting out of our comfort level. But I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's actually a good thing. That, uh, that shows us that, that the, the, as, as we get together as a body of Christ, we understand that we, we get sometimes, and I preached on this literally a couple of weeks back, about how sometimes we're too comfortable with our Christianity, and we like the luxuries as opposed to liking what it is that we're following. And so today we're going to pick up the sixth chapter as we start part six, the final installment, installment of Not a Fan. The sixth chapter of John, and if you guys want to take your jackets off and that kind of stuff, that, that's whatever's good for you, as long as it's appropriate for the church, I'm all right with that. Right? <laughs> so uh, uh, what we see here, the sixth chapter of John, is we see here that that there are, as we as we read in the very back, in the very beginning, we see that there's a lot of people following after Jesus, and, and Jesus Christ was was there feeding these. As a matter of fact, the sixth chapter of John, we see that there, there was about uh, 5,000 men, Scripture says, 5,000 men that, that was following after Jesus, that Jesus was going to feed. But when you take in consideration the women and the children, you know, had 15 to 25,000 mouths. That's a lot of folks to feed, right? And so what's happening here is Jesus is going to have one of those to find the relationship moment with his crowd and uh, those that are following him. And you know, after a full day that uh, they were listening to his teachings, they were hyped up about, about seeing Jesus, and now all of a sudden, they were getting hungry. 
And then they wanted to uh, see what Jesus was going to do about it. You see here, Jesus asked here in the sixth chapter, Jesus asked uh, his disciples, tells them, say, how are we going to feed these folks? And, and one of the disciples, Philip, Philip, he was not really having it. He, he kind of said, hey, it would, even if we had eight months worth of wages, we still couldn't buy enough bread to feed these folks. That was Philip's response. Andrew here. Andrew, he had a whole different response. Andrew would stand in the crowd whenever Jesus asked that. He was looking ahead of time. He was out there and, and he had faith enough that he knew that, hey, this is Jesus. I've seen him perform miracles. It ain't nothing for him to beat these folks. I've seen him heal the blame and, 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 and make the give eyesight to the blind. I've seen all these things. Beating these folks ain't nothing for him. And so Andrew, as he's scanning the crowd, he sees this, this young boy. Let's read John the sixth chapter. Reading from the uh, Christian Standard uh, Version this morning, Christian Standard Bible. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the Jewish feast, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming towards him, and he asked Philip, Where do we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread couldn't be enough to feed all of these people, for they didn't even have a little bit. Verse 8, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, and, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Help the people sit down. And he grasped the place, and they sat down, and the men numbered about 5,000. <clears> then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he here, he gave thanks to God. After he gave thanks, he distributed it to them, those who were seated. So also with the fish, and as much as they, they he also gave them the fish, as much as they wanted. Verse 12, when they were full, he told them to collect the leftovers, that nothing was wasted. So they collected them, and filled 12 baskets with pieces with the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. You see, Jesus took this boy's sack lunch and he fed the entire crowd. And it says here that not only did they feed him, but they had leftovers. That's a lot of food. For 50, 25,000 dollars, that's a, uh, for 50, 25,000 people, that's a lot of food. But hey, this is Jesus we're talking about. This is not some random old boy. This is Jesus. This is the Messiah. And he can do these things. He can do all these things that, that we ask him to do and even more. We, we need to be followers so we can understand the relationships that Christ has with his people so we too can fall out and fall into this, this category. The category is that being followers of Christ, believing in Christ, and believing in Christ can do big things. So, it's what takes place. Let's get down to verse 22. You see, after dinner, the people decided to camp out. And they stayed the night. And they came with Jesus the next day. Hey, if they were fans, let's give them credit. They were committed fans. They just didn't eat and run. <coughs> they hate and wanted to hang out. Verse 22. <coughs> the next day, the crowd had stayed on the other side of the sea where they had been only one boat. They also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone off alone. So the boats from Tiberias came, and, and near the place where they had eaten bread after the, the, the Lord had given thanks, verse 24, then the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. So what did they do? They got their boats and went home. No, nope, that's not what it says. Is it? it says they got their boats, they went to Capernaum. And they went looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, hey, how'd you get here? Let's break this down a little bit this morning, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the next morning, they wake up, and they're hungry again. And they're ready for a little breakfast. Because as I told you guys just before, when God does things, He does things big. So this bread and the fish that He gave them, and I said, I said this many, many times before, this was the best bread and the best fish probably they've ever eaten in their life. Amen. You thought that red lobster was good. <laughs> and it is pretty good. But this smashes red lobster. And those cheddar biscuits, oh my goodness gracious. 
<laughs> Woo, I can get started on that, but I won't. But what you see here is when Jesus does things, He does things big. He doesn't play around. Jesus, when He does things big and big miracles, He, he, he does things big. So why in the world then do we limit Jesus on what He can do? Why is it then when we ask things that sometimes we're so downtrodden it, and then we pray and we say, Lord, if it be your will, and this, and then we're so downtrodden, we pray, hey, if you're a child of God, pray with some, some faith. Amen. Hey, believe what, what you're saying, right? Lord, if, it, if, if, it, if it's your, and, and you know, you, you oh Lord, I'm so downtrodden this. And there's nothing wrong with being humble. God says we should be humble before the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is believe and expect. Believe and expect a miracle. Believe and expect that Jesus is going to answer. Pray to God and, and believe in what it is you're saying. Don't just pray and go through the motions and go, well, I know you can, but you're probably not going to. Jesus is like, oh, wait a minute there. Aren't you contradicting yourself? Why in the world are you sitting there praying to me when you don't believe in the first place? Mm, that'll preach, huh? Why are you praying right there? Why are you praying to me when you don't believe in the first place? Why are you praying for it? You pray to believe? God does big things. They woke up the next morning, they wanted some of that good breakfast, aka their meal ticket. They went around looking for him. They found out that Jesus was on the other side of the lake. Instead of going home, hey, at least they went to be with Jesus. So this crowd seems to have a high priority of being with Jesus. Hey, maybe they're more than fans after all. Maybe they are followers of Christ. Alright? So by the time they catch up to Jesus on the other side, they're starving. They've already missed breakfast. And lunch is bearing down on them. And, and they're, you know, Jesus here, they want the all you can eat buffet again. All right? That's what's taking place. And in verse 26 here, Jesus, he, he's, he knocked out the all you can eat buffet. All right? The time was over for that. <coughs> the timing was over for that. No more free samples. He's now going to ask them and give them a define the relationship moment here. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God has miracles for you. I believe that God has miracles for us. God delivers us, takes care of us. And I really believe with all my heart that God can and does do that. I believe that miracles continue to this day. I believe that God uses people and, and, and God is still in the miracle business. I don't believe that seats. I know there's some folks that, that believe that that, that uh, uh, they, that seats the scripture. I don't believe that. I believe it continues to go. I know that I've seen them all night. That's all I can base that upon. Uh, so uh, we see here that, that Jesus here continues to do miracles and then the miracle ceased. All right? The miracle of the free food ceased. And then he's going to ask them to find that relationship in verse 26. Verse 26, Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you like my grub. That's exactly what he says there in verse 26. Hey, you came over here not looking for me to see what I can do because I am the Messiah. You came over here for the free food, the free sample. Mm, to find the relationship moment on that, huh? He, he calls the mountain straight up. Verse 27. He said, and verse 26 says, because you ate the loaves and you were filled, you were full. Verse 27. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set His approval on Him. Wow. Wait a minute here. He's basically telling them, hey, you all boys are coming over here because that fish and those biscuits were good. However, I've got something more for you. Now what about when we come to church? We come to church and we seek a word from God. We want to, to feel God. We want to, to be able to have that relationship with God. And then God says that to find the moment, the, the, the moment thing says, there's something more than going to church and feeling an emotion. There's something more than going to church. And, and sometimes I think that in churches today, what we've done, ladies and gentlemen, is we've relegated emotion to worship. I think that's wrong. I think worship is way more, way more deep than an emotion. You can sit there and laugh and cry and do everything you want to. Is that worship? That's an emotion. 
Worship comes when God shows up. Amen? Amen. Worship comes whenever God the Father shows up. The very first time that worship was ever, ever in the Bible is when, when Abraham was going to go up and sacrifice his son at the altar, Isaac. That's right. And what he said then, he went up and he says, we, me and the boy, we will go up and we will worship. He had no idea what was going to take place. He had given the, his boy the, the fire and the wood and everything. He basically took up everything up this mountain to, 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 to the, sacrifice his son. And his son's carried everything to do that with. However, Abraham had faith in God. He knew God was going to take care of him. He had no idea how. He had no idea how God was going to show up. But he knew that he was going to worship. And he knew that worship cost you something. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, worship costs you something. If you're going to have true worship with God the Father, that costs you something. You just don't go through the motions and have true worship. Worship with God the Father costs. It comes at a cost, at a price. You see, Jesus decides to have this define the relationship talk with the crowd, and He knows these people, and they're not going to all go along with it because they're there for the food. When the food drives up here in verse 35, let's get down to verse 35. This is what Jesus says. Jesus offers himself. But the question is, would that be enough for you? The question is, is that enough for you? You have all the perks of Jesus. You have the fellowship of Jesus. You have all this other stuff that we can come along to a church and we get all the other perks that goes along with that. But is Jesus enough for you? Verse 35. Jesus says, for I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, no one comes to me, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. He's saying it's going way deeper than food. It goes way deeper than that. And we, ladies and gentlemen, need to understand that Jesus Christ this morning has given us all the divine, the divine relationship moment. Are you here because of the perks of what you get out of God? Are you here because God for who He is? Amen. That's just as plain talk as I know how. And that's, that's the truth. First point I want to make this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is when Jesus is the only thing on the menu, you find out if He's the, the He's you find out if He's the one you are really hungry for. If Jesus is the only thing on the menu, you find out if He's the only thing that you're really hungry for. In other words, when there's no other options, is Jesus enough for you? When there's absolutely no other options, is Jesus enough for you? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've had the privilege to be around a lot of folks in life, and, I, and I've seen them, how they, they have gone from, from being a fan of Christ to a follower of Christ. I've seen people about how they have, have, have been on, 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 on maybe deathbed or different uh, conversions, and how they've gone from being a, simply a, a fan of Christ to a follower of Christ. I'm going to talk to you guys about two, two guys that I, I grew up with inside the church, inside the youth group. Um, I'll tell you one of them's name, and the other one, I didn't get it. I was trying to get the other one to give his permission, so I'll just, um, I'll just use an initial for his name. I want to make sure that, that everybody is, is, uh, is okay with, with this, and I think that, I know that he will be. But I know that all three of us went to the same youth group at the same time, and I know that all three of us straight away. Some of us in various directions. But when Jesus Christ is the only thing on the menu, is that what you're hungry for? Well, let me tell you about that. I know that you know that my, my testimony about how, how I've gone through and did my crazy days and, and came back to the Lord. I praise God for that. But I want to talk to you about, about even plugged into the church. You see, I, I was going to church and I was inside the church and I was a part of the church. And as that was uh, taking place there, I, I skipped out on a lot. I decided that, hey, Sunday school maybe wasn't for me, so I didn't go to Sunday school. And I, maybe I, 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 Sunday nights, I didn't go to Sunday nights. And I had all these things. So at the time, I loved Dallas Cowboys. I, I've since been, been reformed, and that's a phrase on that. I used to like them back when they won, but, you know. Anyway, that's another story for another time. But, uh, uh, boy, I would, if the Dallas Cowboys were playing on a Sunday night, there was no way that I was going to church, because my church was right in front of my living room watching my big screen television, watching the Dallas Cowboys play. 
that was what I thought that I was going to do, and that's what I did for a long, long time. It wasn't until I understood what being a follower of Christ meant, and that meant that I need to actually learn more about it. I actually need to read Scripture. I actually need to get plugged in and be around like-minded people. And when I did that, I thought, ah, I don't know about all this stuff. But I will tell you that when I started going to Sunday school, and I will tell you that whenever I started to to, to, to uh, get plugged in on Sunday night church and Wednesday night church and I started getting plugged in with various things about how my personal faith grew and I've seen what it does whenever you get plugged in with the body of Christ and, and, and I've also seen what becoming a fan into a follower can do. It change your life completely. Absolutely completely. A friend of mine named Tony. Tony, I grew up with him. Tony, same youth group as Tony. Tony became a drug addict. Tony was a drug addict, and he, he, he was in and out of prison. As a matter of fact, I have a, I have a picture that I wanted to show you guys on the PowerPoint uh, about my friend Tony. And I, and I called him and I asked him if, if I could use that, and uh, he said yes. But let me tell you about Tony. Being in and out of prison, he was a, he was a, a, a drug dealer. He, Tony was a, a, a skinhead. He was a racist. Tony was in and out of prison, prison numerous times. I'm here to tell you that today they had a defined, Tony had a defined relationship with with God. You see, he, like, like many of us, walked around with God in the circles of God, being a fan of God, as long as it was good for him. But I want you to see on the right there, Tony's now a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tony. If you saw Tony, he's a very intimidating gentleman because uh, he's got tattoos all over his face. He's got tattoos everywhere that you can imagine. And he looks, he's like, he's one of those guys, just, if you saw him, he walked in right now. I'm going to have him speak to us sometime. But he, he, he's intimidated by his look. But that was before Jesus. You see, what took place after that is he understood, okay, that's who I once was, but I'm not that person anymore. And Things do not define me. And so my friend Tony, is he still, you know, working progress than we all are, but he's spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ now. God had to define the, the relationship moment with, with my brother Tony. And uh, uh, praise God that he is serving our Lord now. You know, there's plenty of stories that I can tell you. I, uh, I'm not going to because right now we all kind of maybe a little more comfortable right now. As far as the heat and all, but I, I don't want to tell you all the other stories, but I can tell you stories about when children with cancer that have been around, or children that's passed away that I've been through, about how parents got divorced and, and the children, the, 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 the tail end of that, about about how addiction, I've been around people helping them with addiction struggles and, and trying to help them through, through life on bad things. It seems that the things are unbearable. It seems like, you know, I've been around with people that, that uh, their lives seem to be falling apart. And suddenly, I'm going to tell you this, that every single person, whether it's a, whether it's a, deep, uh, a deep trouble as far as a health concern, to a deep trouble with some kind of the law or some kind of trouble that they put themselves in as far as sin or something like that, uh, when bad things happen, suddenly, let me just be straight up with you, religion, a little bit of religion is not enough when those things happen. Suddenly, the spectacle, the fish, the loaves, on that Sunday service, hey, it just doesn't cut it. And uh, in those moments, those times that Jesus is the only thing, he's left on the menu, so to speak, and they find out exactly what they need. When you're at the bottom of the barrel, ladies and gentlemen, you're grasping at straws, and I've been around a lot of people who uh, with the, that are at the bottom of the barrel, they grasp at straws, and most of the time they grasp for Jesus. When you've been around people and you see people and people are dying and struggling, and I've been on car wrecks, I've been on different people with in horrible situations that I have just been in those in those spots where I've been able to be with folks, gunshot victims, you name it. Somebody getting run over in a car. I've been on these, and so in those times, I've never seen anybody cry out to anything else but God. Now some gods, some people cry out to God for the wrong reasons. Because they're blaming God, and, and God doesn't cause sin. You chose that, okay? So you choose sin. So if, if 
if, if you chose to go get drunk as a skunk and you drive out here and you get hit by 18 wheeler, God did not cause you to put that beer in your mouth to drive in front of the 18 wheeler, right? So that was a personal choice that you made. And other times, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to, 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 to kids? And why are things, uh, these kind of things happen? I don't have an answer to that. I'm not God. <coughs> But I will tell you this, if God loves us, it takes care of us, and even in horrible circumstances, God is there. We live in a fallen world, we live in a world that, that is a, a world of, of, of sin and hatred and evil. There's a lot of evil in this world, there's a lot of things, and it continues to be evil in this world. And uh, maybe you will take that man into this side but there's a lot of evil in this world, and I don't know why, but I do know that God is there for us, and He wants us to have that relationship with us. He cries out to these folks, and He says, hey, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And let's get down to verse 60 with please. You see, the crowd has to decide this is enough. What about you? Are you, is Jesus enough for you? John the 60th, the 6th chapter, verse 60 down here, says this, Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching's hard. Who can accept it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, asked them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Verse 63, the Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some among you who don't believe. But Jesus knew that from the beginning, those who did not believe are the ones who would betray him. Verse 65 said, This is why I told you that no man can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Verse 66, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus saying this divine relationship this moment. You see, Jesus had thrown all this stuff out at the followers. 15 to 25,000 individuals. That's a lot of folks. That's everybody a little bit larger than Lovington, a little bit smaller than Hobbs. That's a lot of people coming out to you. And then notice what happens in verse 66. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the 12, you don't want to go away too, do you? You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said to them, all those people that were there for the perks, they were there for the fish, for the for the, the for the for the biscuits, they were there for all these things. And he says to them, You must follow me. I am much greater than any food that you put in your body. Now, how does that relate to us? Well, it relates to us like this. A lot of folks come to church hot and heavy for a, a period of time. I call them the, the, you know, the, the spreader Christians because they'll be hot and heavy for 30, 60 days. And after that, where are they at? Right? Where are you at? If you're in your first 30 or 60 days getting back into church, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand if that's you, understand that walking with God is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Okay? It's long term. It's not a sprint. It's not a short period of time. Many of them split. They left. They left. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, Scripture tells us that. Scripture tells us that as wide is the road that leads to destruction. Scripture tells us in the end that whether we like it or not, most people are just not going to accept Christ's invitation. And most people, there's going to be fans. They go to church or they say they follow God because they like the purpose of what they get out of it. Makes it feel warm and fuzzy inside. Maybe they like the, the purpose of being around a group of individuals or you like your kids going to this service or that service. Or you like the fellowship that you have. Or you like the various perks that, that come along with being a fan of God. But it, as soon as God requires something of us, then we're out of here. As soon as it gets tough, it gets hard, man, we're out of here. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. 
Our life gets hard all the time. There's tough times in life whenever it does get hard. And I said that I said in, in life earlier, I said that when you're at the bottom of the barrel, you reach out. And so the folks, they, they will scatter like quail sometimes. And, and then they get to the bottom of the barrel, and that's when they want to claw their way back to Jesus. You don't have to do that. God's hand's out all the time. And he says to you, come unto me, all who are weary. Come unto me. This is my hand, Christ says. Follow me. Don't just be a fan. Be the follower. You see, John 6, 67, basically he, he says to, to his disciples the same thing. You got to leave me too. You know, a lot of people, they like the idea of heaven. They like the idea of miracles. They like all the, the, free, the free stuff. They like the people around. They like the excitement. They were exactly like these people, the free fish and the free food. And when it's all said and done, like most of everybody else, 50 to 25,000 people got up and left. Now, I don't know what in what context verse 67 was. I don't know in what context that Jesus is, is asking the disciples. I don't know if he's frustrated. I don't know if he's angry. Uh, my guess is he was disappointed. Because if you have gotten all these people and they have seen your miracles, that's the reason why they're out there in the first place. They heard about Jesus. They heard about His miracles. They saw His teaching. They did everything. They came to church, if you will. Let's put this in 2018. They came to church. They saw the show. They heard the preacher. They liked everything about it. And then, to find the relationship, are you a fan or a follower? I'm out. It conflicts with my hobbies. Church, this doesn't work for me. It conflicts with my hobbies. Puts in my lifestyle. I don't like it because the, neg- the preacher is always negative, or the Bible is negative, or I'm always getting chastised, or I this or that, the other. You heard the same excuse I had. Nothing's new. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is the Bible. You can read it for yourselves. You can understand it for yourself. So the Word of God is living. It says sharper than any double-edged sword. So when you read and open up God's Word, you understand that God's Word continues to speak today. And God's Word is all about truth. It's all about love. It's all about showing you a better way. Getting you to be a follower of His. You know, I read this. I read as I was, I was preparing this sermon, this saddens me. This is according to LifeWay Research. 11%, only 11% people said they've read the Bible from the Bible. Only 11%. 11%. So I was doing a little survey. I'd say this front row read it, cover to cover, and everybody else had it. Ladies and gentlemen, if this is what we stand upon, we need to read it. Okay? If this is if this is God's word and you really and you really, really, really believe it's God's word. You need to read it. Uh, that's uh, to me uh, the fan forward thing is, is is that's God's word. You really need to read it. You really need to understand what was going on with that. You see, Jesus, he says to his disciples in verse 67, you know, you're gonna lead to? I don't know. I'm sure he's frustrated. Um, scripture doesn't say it's clear, but I'm sure he's part of it. Put this in, in a in a in a in a situation. What if you started dating somebody way back when, whenever you were single, you started dating somebody. Talk to them on the phone, this, that, and the other. And you say, hey, you want to go out and get a Coke? Yeah, we'll get a Coke. We went out and get a, get a Coke and whatever, drive in or whatever. You hung out with them. You had a good time with them. And then you talked to them on the phone some more. And you said, you want to go out next weekend? Yeah. So you thought, we had a good date this first time. So, so you know, last time I took you to Sonic Drive-In and uh, got you a 50 cent corn dog and a, you know, Route 44 on sale for 99 cents because that's a high roll like that, right? And so the next time, no, hey, well, next time I'm going to make it a little better. So you go to a different place and maybe up the any a little bit. You go, hey, you go to the movie theater, you spend like 150 bucks on popcorn and, you know, drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you up the ante a little bit, right? So you have no, now you have more at stake in that and you're going through the relationship and you are, you know, you're going on and, and every time that you as a guy ask that girl, she said, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go to the movie theater with you and, 
have all the perks that go along with it, and I'll go to Sonic, and I go all these things, and so then you keep building up, building up, and eventually, hey, I'm going to go to the Saxony room, and or or, or Count Barrett, and spend a thousand dollars on you, you know, and so uh, uh, five hundred or whatever. And so, anyways, <laughs> as you build all this up, you say to that person when you're fixing to go out this important date, you say you want to go out on this weekend. They say yes, and the girl says yes, and so. I want to have this special date lined out. When in the girl's mind, she's thinking, boy, we started off at 56 corn dogs and a 99 cent root 44, and we worked all the way up. I know that we've been out a lot of times, and now Cattle Bear or Saxony is in my reach. So she says, yeah, I'll go out with you. So then you take that girl and you go to the park. You sit down on the little bench in the park in the grass or whatever, and she's looking around at you going, what are we doing? You swore, where's the stuff? And you say, uh um, uh, we're having a date? And she says, uh uh, uh uh, uh this, this is a date? No. We, let's go do something. You need to feed me, you need to give me, you need to give me the perks of this. You see, she then says, uh uh, I don't like this, and I'm out. See, that's the way a lot of Christians are. They work up and they get a little bit of taste of Jesus. And boy, that propels them to the next thing. And then they get a little bit bigger taste of Jesus. And boy, that propels them to the next thing. And then they continue to maybe get plugged into churches and, and to disciple groups and all these things. And boy, they continue to get built up and built up. And it's like, great, now let's go to the next thing. And Jesus says, am I enough for you? It's not about the thing. Am I enough for you? <clears throat> Jesus Christ this morning is asking you exactly that. Am I enough for you? Can you imagine how Jesus felt when he asked his disciples, the men that he's grown closest to, he even asked them in verse 67, he had to ask them, are you guys going to leave too? These are the people that are closest to him that has done every single thing with him. And then now all of a sudden, he asked them, are you going to leave? You see, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to define that relationship and not be a fan of Christ, but a follower of Christ. The disciples asked, some, answered, Simon Peter answered, verse 68 here, it's a teaching guy. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Hallelujah. That's the response that Jesus was wanting. In verse 68, where are we going to go? Who is it that we could go to that's going to be better than you? How in the world can we go and do something else that's going to be better than following Jesus? How is it that we could go out and put other things and then somehow forget about God and go off and, and, and then six months later something bad happened in our lives and then we boy, we're running back to Jesus. God still hears those same folks. But isn't it easier and better if we take Jesus Christ by the hand and walk with Him daily? Amen. You remember what it said in the Scripture we talked about this through this whole Scripture is, is take up your cross daily and follow Him. Carry your cross daily and follow Jesus. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we know that this earth that we, we live in, we know that it's, it's going to falter. We know that there's bad things happening in it. We know all the things that, that we see in the news. Sometimes some of us don't even watch the news anymore because it's so difficult and chaotic. We know bad things are going to happen. But understand this, ladies and gentlemen, if you've read this, you've read the rest of the story. Jesus Christ came to this earth to conquer death, to conquer all the evil of this earth, and eventually, as followers, not fans, unfortunately, as followers of Jesus Christ, as committed followers of Jesus Christ, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will one day spend eternity with God the Father. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, on the flip side of that, I've got to be real with you. On the flip side of that, it says in Matthew, on the flip side of that, it there's going to be many of folks that says, hey, didn't I do this? Didn't I do? Didn't I come to church for you? Put it in 2018 language. 
Then I go to church for you. Then I go to that retreat. Then I sponsor the youth on this trip and that trip. Then I give money to the Baptist children's home. Then I go out with the pastor and, and help fix the air conditioner. Then I do all these things. Jesus Christ says, Depart from me. 2018 members. I don't know who you are. You have done these things, but you don't have me in your heart. There's a difference, ladies and gentlemen, of doing things for Jesus and having Jesus in your heart. You can do things for Jesus all you want to. That does not make you a follower of Jesus Christ. It makes you a fan. Jesus Christ this morning, ladies and gentlemen, He is not interested in fans at all. He's interested in your life and you being a total, committed follower of Jesus Christ, the Messiah that died for you. Right. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I'm just going to sit down where you're at, but this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to think about your relationship. Come on, I'm going to ask you to put you on the spot. And you're going to come and sing for us. as you are in person. So, the, what I want you guys to do now is everything's about your head. And I want you to define the relationship with Jesus. Define your relationship with Jesus. And I want you to ask God to make you dig deep and understand, are you a fan of Jesus? Are you there because of the perks? Are you there because of Jesus? Are you there that if, if Jesus Christ stripped everything out of your life, and you were broke as a joke, that you didn't have, you had no help, everything was, 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 was taken away from you, exactly like Job in Scripture, would you still be a follower of Christ? Ladies and gentlemen, as Carol's fixed the scene, if you need to come forward, everybody head bowed and eyes closed, if you need to come forward, please define that relationship today. If you're just a fan of Christ today, become a follower. I'm going to ask you if you're a follower and you want, I mean, if you're a fan and you want to be a follower, to come forward and pray. If you need to come and accept Christ, then you come forward right now. Let's go and see. Come on, just ask the world. Just ask the world.
real people that you have called us to be. Father, let us examine our own hearts. Lord, change in us, Father, the wicked ways that we have. And let us be able to walk humbly before you, God, in faith and in strength, knowing that you will take care of us, Lord. Use us for your service, Father. You've called us, Father, to, to go out in all the world and make disciples, Father. That was not a recommendation, but a command. So, Father, let us hear your command. You said to love you with all our heart, mind, and strength. If we really love you, Father, we'll do these things. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. I thank you, God, for Bethel Baptist Church. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord.